Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Faith Memorial Church. We're glad that you came out to live, this is live worship this morning. Aren't you glad you're here? That the presence, amen, that's good. I'm glad you're here. The Lord is going to meet with us today. If you're new to Faith Memorial Church, we want you to know that you are welcome here, that the Lord meets with us, that we are here to worship him. Even though uh, COVID kind of has uh, put a damper on the attendance, we are here because we want to stand up and worship the Lord. So stand together, would you please? And we're going to sing, come, now is the time to worship. seated. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to everyone who is able to join us in person this morning and of course everyone on live stream. We are glad you're able to join us this morning as well. Any day that we can be together in the house of the Lord is a good day, right? Amen. Amen. And thank you for coming out this chilly Sunday morning, right? This is a tough time of the year for those of us with small closets. You know what I mean? Where you have to have both the summer clothes and the winter clothes out, but you don't have room for both of them. So you're living out of a tote for a few weeks. That's what I'm doing right now, is living out of a tote. And uh, it's tough, but we'll all get through it. 
Well, as Pastor Jared makes his way up to uh, provide for us the uh, children's message, let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning especially for the promise that you have provided us that where two or three are gathered together, you are in our midst. And Lord, we welcome you in our presence this morning. Lord, and we just thank you for the gift of life that you have so graciously given to each one of us, Lord. And we just pray that you open our ears this morning so that we may hear your voice, Lord, and open up our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. And Lord, we just pray that you bless the rest of our moments this morning together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. So it is October. Time is flying by. October, we are starting a new series, hence why I'm in this. This series is called Amazed, and we are going to be doing some science experiments while we're in Faith Kids. We'll see some amazing science experiments. But here's the thing. No matter how amazing these science experiments are, they're nothing compared to our God. Our God is amazing, and he has done miracles. He is a God of miracles. And we're going to also be talking about some miracles that he has done. Also, we're going to be talking about Elijah, which if you know anything about Elijah, you know there were a lot of miracles done in his time. So before we get started with our story today, who loves food? Who likes food? I love food. Specifically, Skyline Chili is my all-time favorite place. I love it. I love it. This story takes place, though, with a famine. Not good for food lovers, right? A famine. God told Elijah there's going to be a famine, he, so Elijah told the kings. Not good news, right? For any food lovers, it gets worse. So God tells Elijah, I'm going to take care of you. I want you to go to this brook, and that's where you're going to stay. So you have water, right? That's good. Not too bad, right? Unless you don't like camping, then maybe it's not too good for you. But not too bad. But you're probably asking, well, how's he going to get food? We got water. Then God says something that I would not be okay with. I'll have to admit. He says, I am going to send ravens. And they are going to bring you food. I'm going to admit something. I don't like birds. There's just something about them I don't like. I don't know, but I would have some questions probably at that point. Now, here's the thing. Did Elijah question God? He didn't. He just did what God told him to do, and guess what? God provided. God took care of him. I would say that's a miracle right there. We're in the midst of a famine, and God is sending ravens to get Elijah food. That's a pretty big thing, right? Now, here's the thing. God trusted Elijah, God, Elijah trusted God with everything, all of his needs. In the Bible, it's full of promises that God has gave us. We have a hard time with some of those, right? We worry and stress about things that are a lot less important than food and water. But something important to remember, God will take care of us. He has promises in here. He will take care of us. Sometimes it's about trusting God that he will take care of us. Thank you, Pastor Jared, for that reminder to us this morning. And thank you for removing the dead bird from in front of the pulpit. You guys don't understand, there's always something underneath the pulpit when we come up for announcements. And sometimes we don't look what that is before we are walking up here, and this morning it was a dead raven. And uh, it doesn't take much to throw me off, that's for sure, what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, Kids, at this time, you may exit the sanctuary and follow Pastor Jared and the others to children's service. Some are faster than others. Well, at the beginning of announcements this morning, I just want to say thank you for your faithful giving. Um, We can't stress that enough. 
of how grateful we are for your continued giving here at the life of, of Faith Memorial Church. I know it's a tough time for, for all of us and the organizations uh, around our community, but uh, we really do want to thank you for your giving, and faithfully so. Also, coming up in just less than three weeks, believe it or not, is the Faith Fest, Friday the 23rd, and there were supposed to be a couple teens that were giving the announcements this morning, but one of them had to be gone this morning, and the other one didn't want to come up by herself, Andy Green, so, but I, it's okay. They did want me to, to stress, though, that this is an event that needs lots of assistance, and many, have, many of you, many of you have, uh, have taken the cards down to donate items, but they also need your help to help run different portions of the event. And this is a community outreach initi initiative here at Faith Memorial Church, and we're specifically focusing on the neighborhoods that are right around us. And if you've noticed lately, the neighborhoods right around us are growing very rapidly. And there's lots of young families with children and teens in, in our communities right around here, and we just want to provide something for them here in a couple weeks to try to kind of get them closer to us, let them know how much we love and care for them, and this is what this is. So if you wouldn't mind, some of you just make your way to the foyer when service is over, see the gals, and ask them, hey, what can I sign up for? Glad to help. They would be grateful for that. That's pretty much all that I have. I did want to remind us, though, of Wednesday night. Wednesday night is happening. Groups are meeting, children's, teens, and adults. And, uh, you know, we're, we have uh, plenty of people coming out, and the uh, youth services are going well, slowly getting youth back. And I know I don't talk a lot about what we do in youth service. Some of you may be hearing for the first time we have a midweek youth service, but it's a great time of fellowship. We do uh, activities and, and games that the kids really enjoy, but we also study the Bible. And I just wrote down here just a few things that we've been studying lately just to kind of give you a snapshot of kind of where we're at. Uh, we are going to be starting to work through Matthew starting this week. We're going we're gonna to be on the book of Matthew for probably uh, two or three months, so it's going to be very exciting. But just to kind of give you a snapshot of what we've been talking about lately, uh, two Wednesdays ago, we talked about how a teen should think biblically about injustice and inequality, kind of an important topic right now. This past Wednesday, we talked about who is my neighbor, and then this Wednesday, we're going to talk about temptation. So just a little snapshot of what we do, what we're talking about on Wednesday night. At this point, I'm going to give the birthdays and anniversaries, and Michelle is going to prepare to come up during that time, if you don't mind, and tell us about Operation Christmas Child. So coming up this week, our birthdays are Bethany Heron, which is our daycare administrator, Shirley Starner, Justina Iser, John Kitts, Deborah Brown, Cameron Bennett, Josh Peck, Tom Wooliver, and Josiah Darfus. So happy birthday to all of those. And I'm looking down here, and it looks like we have one kind of important anniversary. And it's today, I believe. Jonathan and Sharma Morgan were married in 1980. Yeah. So I believe that adds up to 40 years. Lots of things I want to say right now, but <laughs> I'll, I'll just say, say one, which is Sharma, you've had 40 years. We've given you 40 years to take care of this. <laughs> okay, at this point, Michelle, and then I believe Keith asked to come up after Michelle and make an announcement, so Keith is going to come up after that. Good morning. So I think you all probably know that yesterday we had a packing party, and with the packing party that I had at my house, the total shoe boxes packed is 1,647. Wow. So that's pretty amazing. <laughs> now, we still have a goal of 2020. So 2020 is the goal, and so that means we only need 373 more. The children are having a packing party in November, and we could have packed more yesterday because we had plenty of soap, school supplies, stuffed animals, toothbrushes, but what we ran out of are toys. 
So if any of you can you know, find those bargains and bring in some toys, that would be great. Uh, and the kids will pack boxes. And then there's also boxes out in, in both entrances that you can take home and pack. And I know a lot of you like to do that. Don't forget to include a note in the box that last long after the box is gone and kids have been known to carry those around into adulthood. So that's really important. We only have six Sundays until National Collection Week. And this year, we've moved up a notch in the hierarchy of Operation Christmas Child. In the past few years, I think five years, we've been a drop-off location. And now we're going to be a central drop-off location. And the biggest difference is we're going to need more strong young lads and older men to help uh, because we will have a semi sitting out in our parking lot because we'll have other drop-off locations bringing their cartons to us, and, plus our own. So we'll need help getting those, that semi loaded, uh, mostly the last day. So we'll be talking about that more in the future, but it's, uh, it's really exciting to know that um, we're moving up and, and helping to fulfill a, a new need in the organization and ministry of Operation Christmas Child. Um, I wanted to just say thank you to all of you who helped throughout the year. I don't know if a lot of you realize we have, um, we have people who just want to fold the shoeboxes. We have people who are shut-ins and they take toys out of packaging and wrap soap and wash rags. We have monthly gatherings where we get together and do more of the same. Um, we have people who are year-round shoppers. And I know um, for them, it's a real joy, but it takes a lot out of their pocket because all of it comes from our own resources. Um, and they tell their husbands it's a real gift and they're ministering. So uh, we have people who are sewers. They make pencil pouches. We have crocheters and knitters. So there's a lot that goes into this. And yesterday, you can see the picture up there, the cutest little girl in the world, my great granddaughter. Uh, we put her to work, so we have children involved. We had youth come yesterday, which was a real blessing. And we have a lot of older, steadfast people who help us all the time. So um, I guess the main thing is keep praying. Please keep shopping and bringing in those things. We only need 373. We're a huge congregation. We can do this. So thank you very much. I appreciate you and love you all. Thanks. Good morning. Well, October has arrived. You can tell it with the cool weather. And so with that comes Pastor Appreciation Month. So um, Jonathan has assembled a wonderful team of pastors here and Pastor Mike and Pastor Jared, Pastor Aaron, and of course, Dr. Case. And so I hope that you guys will take this opportunity with me just to stand with me and show them how much we appreciate them. So would you please? Just as a quick reminder, we have baskets out front and then back here, just where you can drop a, uh, a card for encouragement. But I can tell you that each and every one of them, if you were to ask them what, they, what we could do for them, they will simply say, pray for them. Um, they face uh, just incredible challenges. And so let's just commit that we can do that for them. Thank you. Okay, we're going to ask you to stand as we continue our worship in music this morning. Would you stand together?
as we stand on that solid foundation, we will trust and we will obey. Amen.
may be seated. For those of you who wonder what will be Pastor Aaron's condition tomorrow, We'll try to keep the marks that will be on him hidden, um, but uh, it's always good to have Pastor Aaron share his thoughts, and we appreciate them immensely. We have another privileged moment, and that privileged moment is to look together at God's Word. I never grow weary of the privilege of looking together at God's Word. How fortunate we are that we have access, as we have, to the Word of God. In fact, just the other day, I, um, Sharma and I were out, and I said, you know, the reality is the last Bible that I purchased, and this will give you an indication of where I am in life, the print is a little too small. So I, uh, I found, I like the way that this was put on the uh, backing or on the um, packaging of the Bible that I purchased, comfort, I think I, comfort reading, whatever that was, I thought what that means is a Bible for a geezer to help somebody who can read it. So I picked up one of those comfort versions and uh, indeed I thought though how perfectly stated when one considers. It is indeed our comfort. We're looking today from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 21, and uh, it is, without question, one of those hallmark texts. I know we have been standing for a while, but out of reverence for God's Word, would you stand with me again? And let's look together at Exodus 21. We'll read 1 through 21. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to, the, to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy." Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All the people perceived the thunder, and the lightning flashes, and the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, "'Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. But let not God speak to us, or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, for God has come in order to test you, and in order, in order that the fear of Him 
may remain with you so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. You may be seated. For those of us who might need a little bit of a reminder, this is a specific, just landmark moment in Israel's history. It is, in fact, one of their most important historical days. It marks so much for them. It's critical for them, but not just for Judaism. It is a landmark day for us as well. This is none other than the Sinai event, 50 days after the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt. Now, some think and some say, and rabbis have suggested, that this is the precursor also for the emphasis of Pentecost. Some debate that, not sure if it is or not, but it's significant. The reality is, this is a moment in Israel's history when they recognize we were in the unmitigated presence of the living God. We were in the presence of the Holy One, whose name is Holy, the God before whom we live, the God with whom we have to do. They were in the presence of a God who condescended to speak to them through the mediator, Moses. You know, I've been speaking about the reality, and it's a burden of my heart, that we desperately need in churches in our culture, we desperately need revival. If we're going to have revival, if we're going to have the privilege of being reformed, if we're going to have the opportunity of the blessings of God in a revival reality, if we are going to be redeemed, if we are going to be brought back into true, vibrant, covenant knowledge of God, if that is going to happen, I believe there is a significant, penetrating, pervasive reality that needs to come to us in order for that to happen. I believe with all of my heart that we have fabricated a picture of God and have believed it so long and held to it kind of by default that it has crept in and it has diminished God even among those who call themselves and refer to themselves as His people. We have this idea of kind of a grandfatherly figure who regardless of the antics and the actions and the disobedience of his children, somehow just still dotes on them and still lavishes affection on them and shakes his head occasionally as if he might be a little bit disappointed, but he just continues to love us, a very sentimental view of God. We have heard so long about the love of God that we have forgotten some of the essential corollaries that go along with that love. And so we have in front of us today one of those moments. We have before us on the pages of Scripture, Sinai. Sinai. Back in the day when revivals were pretty common, and in fact, a lot of churches called those protracted meetings. They had a beginning date, but if you notice back, way back in the day, if any of us can remember that far back, you didn't have a closing date. And the reason for that was, the idea behind all of that was this. We hope and pray God meets with us, and if He does, we're not sure when we're going to shut the thing down. We'll leave that to God. So the whole idea was, we hope and pray to meet with God. I have read the notes of a lot of those great evangelists, and they would describe their preaching in very, very interesting ways. In fact, many of them that were known for their fiery preaching would say such things like, preached 10 days on Sinai. It was Sinai truth. A couple of the ending days, it was, it was Calvary. But prior to that, leading up to that, it was Sinai 
Sinai. We've forgotten Sinai. We have a little friend called Jesus. We have a buddy we call God. We've lost Sinai. We've lost the profound impact of Sinai. So today I want us to at least consider for a moment and let it sink in with the help of God's Spirit, what is Sinai all about? Now, I want to say this at the outset. For those who would say the God of the Old Testament is one God and the God of the New Testament is another, God is not split personality. Okay? Just want to remind us of that. God is not one God here and a different God here. God is one God, consistent, and every expression that is recorded in His Word is consistent with His holiness, His holy character, His essence, and His dealings with you and me. There isn't anything about God that we can say, well, I like that part, I'll hold on to that. The other parts, that that stuff that I find somewhat offensive to my sensitivity, I will discount. I had a guy tell me, and this was an educated individual, I've just decided that as I see things in the Bible that, about God that do not speak to me very clearly about God being gracious and a God of grace, I've just decided I'm not going to pay any attention to those passages. I said to him, well, where do you get the idea that the Bible is authoritative then about any passage or about any characteristic about God? If you feel if you, feel you have kind of line item veto to say what you like about God and what you don't like about God, and what you like about God you'll hold on to, and what you don't like about God you'll, you'll kick to the trash. Where do you find any authority even to say to you what you've believed that you like about God is indeed authoritative and true? We take it all. We take it all. For God has revealed Himself to be this to be this essence, to be this nature, and you and I are to get in line with it and not quibble with it. I really believe with all of my heart, if we're going to encounter revival in the church today, we need a Sinai moment. Moments where we know We need a mediator because I dare not have God speak to me directly or I'll die. We need a rekindling. We need a revisiting of the notion that God is truly awesome. Now, I don't mean awesome, dude. I mean awesome. When you look at Him, when you consider Him, when you understand your relationship to Him, when you get it in your heart that you deal with Him and that He will deal with you, it strikes in you a very constructive awe and fear. If we're ever going to be turned in this culture, if we are ever going to be reformed, if we are ever going to experience another awakening in our godless culture. It will not be God visiting the lost first. It will be God raising from the dead those who call themselves His children. Without revival in the church, there will be no awakening in our culture. No revival in the church, no awakening in the culture. The church is God's emissary to darkness. But if we are not light, we have no bearing on the darkness. I mean, that's just the way this works. We understand that, right? If the world is vapid and tasteless and decaying, if salt loses its saltiness, that's the church, there is no hope of stemming its decay. 
We need a Sinai moment. We need a Sinai revisiting. There are four thoughts that I will do my best to just share uh, briefly. What do we see in this text, and what do we learn from it? What are the lessons contained in it that speak to us about what is essential if we are ever going to be really, truly, covenantally formed or reformed into the people of God? What must happen? First of all, audience. Audience. We need once again, as those who profess to be followers of Jesus and proclaim to be the people of God, we need to assemble not to be entertained, not to be cajoled, not to have our itching spots scratched, but we need to assemble to hear from someone a specific critical something that we lack. If there's ever a day to give God audience, it's today. If if there was ever a day when the people of God need to quit worrying about whether or not my favorite coffee creamer will be at that spot, we need to say more than anything else, I need to hear from the living God. So I'm showing up, not because, oh, they do, the little, they, you know, they do the music a little bit better than there. I am so sick of the trivialities that mean nothing for our never-dying souls. The tail not only wags the dog, I think maybe something farther away than even the tail wags the dog. I mean, we've, we don't even have the tail anymore. We care about such nonsense. We care about such insignificant things that we've acquired some kind of a first priority palette for that if I don't get this on my taste buds, I'm not coming back. Our greatest need that cuts through all the murkiness and sets things right and puts things in order is we need, we must hear from the Word of God. We need to hear from God. So, first of all, we don't need to give anyone else first audience than God. I want us to note how the 20th chapter of Exodus begins. We learn a little bit from the last verse of 19. So Moses went down to the people and told them. And then look at verse 1. Then God spoke all these words. Oh, how we need today. Not my opinion, not your opinion, not somebody else's thoughts, not someone else's interpretation. Our greatest need is just the absolute, clearly stated, stripped away from opinion version, God speaking His words. So if there's ever a need that we have today, listening to this voice, listening to that voice, hearing this, hearing that, the din of noises that can easily just overwhelm us. We need to hear as an audience. We need to hear the voice of God. We need to see the ear markings of His presence. We need to know we have been in the presence of God. Audience. Second thing that we need today is we need clearly stated realities about who God is. Essence. If we need to give this God audience, we need to understand why, and that, we find that in His essence. And look at what God says to them, I am, I am. Don't forget that Yahweh, Jehovah, 
that I am-ness is what Jesus picks up on, and especially in John's gospel, is given to us over and over again, the I am statements of John. I am. In other words, there isn't any other am than that I am. So essence, essence, understanding who God is brings us then to preeminence. So let's look at verse 2. I am the Lord, your God. I am Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and more specifically, brought you out of the house of slavery. Who am I, God is saying? I am the singular one. Who delivered you. Don't look anywhere else. Don't put stock anywhere else. You want to know who I am? I am the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Kind of generically, that location where you found yourselves. But more specifically, I brought you out of your condition. I brought you out of slavery. Hmm. Don't worry, we're headed somewhere. His essence, He is the Lord our God. His reasons behind why we should ever worship Him, because He is the Holy One whose name is Holy, the one and only One who is above all, the only true God, surpassing in every way. And I am the One who visited upon all of the deities of Egypt my surpassing power, and I delivered you. Now, we're going to find here in the ten words, we're going to find God saying, you're not going to have any, any worship that looks at an image, whether it's in the heavens, on earth, in the, in, or in the water. They just came out of Egypt. They worshiped beetles. Not the group from England but they, they worshipped scarabs. Yeah. Bugs. Beetles. You can't make this up. Only sinfully blind people would bend the knee to bugs. Go figure. Thank you, beetle, for your beetleness. You can't get that stupid. You have to try. You have to work hard. But I'll tell you what, when you kick the one true and living God out of your life, stupid's all you get. So whether it was a frog, whether it was a fish, whether it was one of the birds of the air, whatever, they had a God for everything. And I'm not kidding you, they worshipped beetles. I'm telling you what, the human condition without God is just desperately hopeless without God. So God says, remember, I'm the one who delivered you from the land of Egypt. I'm the one that extricated you from your slavery, from your plight of slavery. Well, if we're to give Him audience, and if we're to look at His essence, and if we are to understand His preeminence, then one sensible response should be from us, rendered to Him, our obedience. We don't talk a lot about that today in churches. It's mostly just... Um, you want a friend? He's Jesus. Um, you want to have a, you know, a, a hip, cool bud to bail you out of hard stuff? It's Jesus. You don't hear much about obedience. These are words we don't like in our culture anymore. Because down deep in the narcissistic heart that has been nurtured in our culture, 
there is an attitude that pushes back abruptly and with great bristle, don't tell me what to do. Well, you know, what, you know who tells us what to do? Newsflash, God does. God actually has the audacity to enter into your life and, yes, tell you what to do. He does so in what is known as ten words. Ten words. In two tables, he gives four in one, six in the other. I'm a little slow with math, but that's ten The four deal with our vertical understanding and the norms that are essential to understand, enter into covenant with this great God. How we address this great God. The other six deal with our horizontal relationships with other human beings. How we respect one another, how we do not steal from one another, how we do not defraud one another, how we do not go after the prized realities of relationships and spoil them. We have that table too. And we, we just read that today. It's good to go back and revisit those. Ten words. God summarized in ten words, and then Jesus summarized all of this in two commandments. In the New Testament, love God with all your being and your neighbor as yourself. Obedience. Ten words, and God has said these kinds of things. You shall. You will. Or if you're reading out of the King James, thou shalt. Obedience. All of this, an encounter with God at Sinai, has this ultimate objective, reverence, reverence. At least momentarily, it dawned on this obstinate people group. And listen, let's just face it, just look at the Pentateuch, look at the first five books of the Bible. Look at Exodus, look at Leviticus, look at, before you get to Deuteronomy, look at Numbers or in the wilderness. Look at all of that. Read it. Read about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Read about all those characters. And one thing you're reminded of is these were a pain-in-the-neck people. I mean, it's just an unvarnished reality. And what God is always getting at is this reality. We have, as a chief componentry of who we are in our collective DNA, we have the capacity for and the necessity to deliver reverence. Reverence. It's an interesting word. It means, first of all, awe. We've already talked about that. It involves worship. It involves and includes constructive fear, deep devotional awe and love, respect. After God spoke and the ten words were delivered, all the people, verse 18, perceived the thunder, the lightning flashes, the sound of a trumpet, and the mountain smoking. Previous chapter, fire. Why was the mountain smoking? Because God's presence was that of a fire, a kindled fire. Interesting how a lot of those kinds of things are sometimes thrown out in our ability to conjure up imagery. But only God can deliver the real deal. So there were trumpet blasts and there were lightning flashes and thunder roared. 
fire was evident, and the mountain smoked. And the people stood at a distance, and they trembled. Then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself, and we will listen. Well, that lasted a while. Speak to us yourself, and we will listen. What they're saying is, we now sign on to the fact, and we corroborate the fact that God has indeed appointed you as our leader and as our mediator. But let not God speak to us, or we will die. Their reverence included, I think it's safe to say, a measure of repentance. Because what they were saying was, we know who we are. We know what we've done. We cannot stand and live if God speaks to us directly. We must have a mediator. Hmm. Hmm. Says I. Moses is a precursor of the mediator of all mediators. I cannot in my condition and my list of actions, I cannot stand before the living God and survive. But you and I have a mediator. He is Jesus the Christ. We have an advocate, John says, in 1 John 2, 1, even Jesus Christ, the righteous one. We have a mediator. I can't go and plead my case to God. I can't stand in the presence of a holy God and live. We need a refresher of that. We need a heightened appreciation for that. We need to understand that sin is always a direct personal affront to a holy God. And don't think it's not. I just want to say to us today, there is a sense. We, we have so softened God so that people would like Him more that we have taken away God's own self-expression that He is a God not to be trifled with, that He is a God not to take lightly. He is not a God for you to arrogantly mess with. Do we understand that? And we need, frankly, we need a refresher course on the fact that God is God. And don't you trifle with Him. And don't you trample on the blood of Jesus. He's the only mediator you have. And without Him, you can never be reconciled to the Father. So they understood at least, help us, Moses. <laughs> help us, Moses. For if God speaks to us directly, we're dead. We're dead. Moses said to the people, this seems interesting, don't fear, just fear. <laughs> That's a paraphrase. Don't fear, just fear. What is he saying? He's saying, don't be engulfed by a kind of fear that only leaves you despondent and hopeless and lost. That is not a constructive fear, but rather fear in this way have a reverential and deferential response to the God who is calling you. Reverence Him. Look at the objective. This is always God's objective. It's found in the last statement of verse 20. So that you may not sin. There's another word we don't hear a lot about today. But God has come. Look back in verse 20. For God has come. He has come. In order to test you. And in order that the fear of Him may remain in you. So that you may not 
sin. What, what a thought. What a truth. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. I'd like to be able to say that a great revival broke out. They never griped about not having the meal that they wanted. They never griped about whether or not they had all the water that they wanted. They never griped. They never complained. And they never did anything wrong to where those first tablets would get broken. But I wouldn't be telling you the whole story, would I? For the first trip down the mountain, when this people we just read about got impatient with the delay of Moses' return from the cloud in the mountain, came to weak need spineless Aaron and said, we need a God. Fashion one for us. Isn't Aaron's response interesting? Take off all your earrings and throw them here. And what did, what did he later say? We put all the gold in the fire and out came this bull. Out came this calf. I don't know how it happened, Moses. It was a miracle. My. You know, I like what Moses did, and then I'll close. Heated that thing up, ground it to powder, poured it on water, and made him drink it. There's a protein drink for you. We need a revisiting of the reality of a God who has condescended to express himself to us and avail himself to us. But because he has come down to us, don't dare bring him down in your heart. He is God. He is God. Father, in these moments we just ask you to speak to us and take this word and use it for your assigned purpose. I believe we can say that you are still calling a people to become a people who have previously not been a people. If we're going to be the people of God, we're going to have to be, without question, those who are giving you audience, listening to you, paying attention to you, obeying you, reverencing you. Minister to us, we pray, as we prepare our hearts. And if we need to pray, Father, I, I, it's always good to pray. It's always good to seek you, even before we receive these elements. It's always good to pray. We just ask you to have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. And I would say that it's always good. It's always right for us to pray. We have a lot, of, a lot of issues that we ought to give consideration to today and reasons to pray. Several weeks ago, Dr. Case reminded us we need to be informed. We need to pray. Even the issue we need to be good citizens and vote. We have many needs today that require us to pray. We have a God we want to make sure our hearts are clear with and clean with today. We need to pray. We have loved ones that are in need. We need to pray. We have even health of our own leaders, health of our president to remember. We have reasons to pray today. So before we receive the elements and while we're singing, I would encourage us, this is a good time to pray.
still want to invite you to come and pray before we receive these elements today. We have much that should cause us to humble ourselves before God and pray. So I just want to open this up for a moment. And if you have a need that you want to bring and present to the Lord in this wonderful, safe place of prayer, I encourage you to do it. If there's one that you are representing today, and if there's a need of someone on your heart, I encourage you also to come and pray. And we're going to take a moment, and we're going to pray before we share at the Lord's table. Father, we recognize, first of all, we are in an ever-present, desperate need of You. Oh God, we need You. Not to be at our beck and call to perform our latest whim, but oh Father, how we need You. We need to quiet ourselves. We need to hear Your Word. We need to stop our own demand. We need to cease our own noise. And we need to quiet ourselves, hush ourselves, humble ourselves, and listen to Your voice. We need to have the kind of heart that as we hear from You, by the help of Your Spirit, by the power of the One who is already speaking to us, We need to be prepared to hear and heed the voice of God. Oh, how we need to obey. Father, we need to subordinate ourselves to who You are. Oh, this thing has been flipped around. Our world has risen up and has said, we are God, but we are not. And Father, we pray that there would be, even in your church, there would be an absolute death to the notion that we can be our own God. And may we humble ourselves before the living God. Repent of our disobedience. Call out for the cleansing of our own hearts and our own conditions. Trust you to apply the blood of your mediator, Jesus, to meet our every spiritual need. Father, bring that kind of a real revival, we pray. May we be reminded of the God of Sinai, we ask. We pray, Father, that as we humble ourselves before you and seek your face, We know you will keep your promise. We know that you will meet with us. We know that if we humble ourselves, you will give us grace. We know that you will in no way cast us off. But Lord, you will meet us and you will meet our need. Bring about, oh God, that kind of transformation in the church of Jesus Christ, we pray. And here, here as well among us, We ask it in Christ's name. And Father, be with the many needs today. They are overwhelming. Many names flood our minds just now. Heal. Touch. Encourage. Give peace. Give heart rest. Provide every need. And Lord, among our congregants, And in addition to our immediate families, touch the lives dear and near to us. And have your way, we pray, for your glory and for your honor and for a good for us that we might not even picture. But you know what is good for us more than anyone else. Do your good in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We are going to prepare, as has been our more recent custom, to serve you in these days. 
and uh, we will have individuals, pastors, on the other side of the altar to serve you and to provide you with what you need, the elements that you need. If you cannot come to the altar, then please make sure that you are able to raise your hand or signal one of the individuals who will be coming around who will be ready to serve you where you are. We don't want to miss anyone, but please just let us know and make it clear enough that we are able to serve you. So if those who are ready to assist, if you would please join me at the communion table, we will then prepare to wait for you. Father, these elements are symbols, but they remind us of a price, a precious price that was paid. Jesus willingly went to the cross. Jesus willingly gave Himself as a ransom for many. His blood was shed. His body was beaten. He entered the domain of death. He came out alive and victorious, and today we express in this simple way our ever-present faith and trust and confidence in His adequacy, in what He has provided, what the atonement has made real for us. Help us as we worship today and receive the bread and the cup to do this in remembrance of Jesus. We ask it in His name. Amen. It's our privilege to serve you for those who are able to come and meet here at the altar. We will provide you with the bread and you may receive then the cup. You may stay here as long as you like, but please come as we receive the elements and worship our Lord Jesus Christ in this moment 
of communion. You may come.
It has been good to be in the house of the Lord. And I trust that as we leave this place, we will be reminded in a fresh way of who our God is and our appropriate response to Him. Amen? Amen. May that be the case. Michelle has asked that if there is anyone who can stay for a few moments and assist with um, Benner, which was where Operation Christmas Child uh, packing party took place yesterday, there are some of the most enjoyable things awaiting you. I don't want to give those things away because it would spoil, um, the, you know, spoil the surprise. But if you'd like to help and you don't know what you're signing on for, we would be glad to have your help. So if you want to help with Michelle, she'll uh, direct you. I don't think it's much, but there are some items that need attention. They worked long and hard yesterday, so if we can assist them in picking things up, I know they'll appreciate it. Let's stand together. Remember the prayer requests? We, every, every week we provide those prayer requests. Some of you have asked me today about uh, our brother-in-law, Dr. Mike Thompson. Be praying for him and uh, his family uh, tomorrow, around 1 o'clock, they will be meeting with a team of doctors and determining all the details about uh, what he is facing with um, the condition in his liver, and they will need your prayers. And I know that we have numerous individuals, Jody Van Dyke healing up from surgery, many others as well, but please remember Dr. Mike Thompson, and we would be grateful as a family uh, if you would remember him. He is uh, chair at Ashland Theological Seminary and has not felt well for years. And finally, some doctors figured it out. Let's pray. Father, as we prepare to leave this place, may we go as radiant reflections of the light of Jesus. We are reminded that Jesus is the light of the world. Help us to reflect His presence. May we be winsome and radiantly drawing to those who want to leave a life of darkness. Help us to be an example and a witness. Use us, Lord, in our world, and we pray for our world. We need an awakening, but Your church first needs a reviving. So, Father, do Your work, start it in us, and then send us into Your world to make disciples. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.